steps to that. Okay. We're going to talk about the four steps to print, and of course that first step is going to be the most important. It's also going to take the longest time, and that's the design phase. So the process of moving through and creating those designs and creating those objects is really what's going to take the longest along with their ideas and making multiple iterations of them. So if we consider that, um, it, in all in all, there's a couple programs that you can use, and they're going to be CAD modeling software. And so in this regard, we kind of have a piece uh, in order to tell you just if you're looking for one. Tinkercad is, of course, a good software, especially for younger ages. And Onshape is another one that also runs on Chromebooks like Tinkercad does, but it's a bit more robust. Uh, do you have familiarity with either of those? Uh, a little bit. We're going to try to do uh, iPads. So, okay. a recommendation, a really easy one for iPad. So, iPad, I know that Onshape has an application on the iPad. I do not know about Tinkercad. Tinkercad would be my recommendation for younger students simply because of the simplicity of dragging and dropping shapes into the environment. Um, and then you kind of group them all together. So I would, I would look for that. I haven't came across something that has been exceptional on an iPad um, compared to base programs on the computer, but I would, I would say Onshape is a good place to start. If you feel like a little bit more, uh, you know, too tough for the students. Uh, I could always research something for you if you would prefer. So. Okay. All right. All right. Well, the only thing we need outside of that phase, we do the designs, we create our process, and we create the object or model. We need to export it as a file type, and that file type is going to be an STL. And STLs stand for Standard Triangle Language, and it basically takes that shape that you had modeled and says, "Let's make this out of triangles." And so it cascades the entire outside of the model in a mesh of triangles all interconnecting by edges and vertices. And then we use that to transfer it to a second program. And that second program is gonna be the slicer like we have kind of talked about a little bit before. And so we're gonna go over the process of installing Cura and loading one of those STLs into it. So if you have your tool kit, in front of you, there should be a small USB drive with an SD card in the back of it. Yep, that green one is perfect. We're simply gonna plug that in. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. When I share my screen, it will cause yours to expand in full screen to mine. You can just hit the escape key to minimize it. All right, so on your SD card, you should have three folders and a user manual. All of the information covered within this training is also in the user manual in case you want to use it. Uh, the other three folders should be Cura, STL files, and test prints. Yep. So we're gonna double click on Cura. We're going to double click on the application. You can either install that on a Mac or a Windows. Okay. So run through the basic installation. It'll ask you a couple of different settings, and then we'll move on to, it'll ask you to prepare a printer. So whenever you get to that point, let me know, and I'll guide you through the rest. Okay. Okay, we just got done dragging it. <clears throat> so let me get into our step here. Sure, I didn't. 
is. Okay, English. <coughs> okay, what okay. do you have? Perfect, so we're gonna select the bottom option or other. Okay. We're gonna click next, and then we're gonna choose the operating kind of system, and this is going to be Mendel, M-E-N-D-E-L. All right, got it. Way down, click next and finish. Now this next menu is gonna build, basically box is going to give us our build space area. And this is going to have on the left-hand side panel is going to be all settings to manipulate our print. And then the middle option is going to be where we see our print objects or STL files. So okay. let's go ahead and change the machine settings to match our A5 printer. And then we'll go over loading the file and changing the print settings to what we want them to be. So if you click here in the top left-hand corner, click on machine, and then choose machine settings. Okay, I've got basic, advanced, plug-in, starting in G. I'm sorry. On. Yes, in the top top toolbar area that says file, oh, machine. Gotcha. There you go. Okay, I'm going to machine settings. Yep. All right. Now it's, we're going to change the width, depth, and height to match our build area. So first we're going to change 125 for the width. All right. Then 150 for the depth. All right. 100 for the height. Gotcha. And the last thing we need to change is that heated bed box. Make sure to uncheck it. Okay. And if you want to change the machine name, you're welcome to. These are called A5 printers. And then click OK and OK one more time. All right. Awesome. So now all we have to do is kind of change our values here on the left hand side to reflect what we would like. And basically through this process, these are all manipulated by yourself and you can change these. We're going to give you just some base values to work with and I'll explain a little bit about each of them. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me. If you feel like you already know it, feel free to push me on. All right. All right, layer height is going to be our biggest determinant of resolution, and it's going to cause us our model to look nice or to look coarse. Now, 0 0.1 is going to be the highest layer height we can use on these printers. So that's going to be 0 0.1 millimeters per layer, and it's going to make a very nice, fine object. 0 0.3 will be the lowest layer height we can utilize. This is going to make a very fast object, but it's going to look coarse and rough. I prefer 0 0.2, I like the mid-range, it still prints in good time, and it also doesn't use as much plastic. Okay. The shell thickness is going to determine how thick our width of the walls are. So these are considered to be horizontal walls, not the bottom and top of your model. These are only the walls that are horizontal to the build area. So we're going to change that value to 0 0.8. Now the box may go yellow and it may be kind of warning you that this isn't proper, but it's due to the fact that our nozzle size is 0 0.5 right now. We're going to change that value to 0 0.4. So down here at the very bottom, we have a nozzle size and the nozzle is a piece of hardware. So it's not going to change obviously unless you change it yourself. So we're going to change that to 0 0.4. And our shelf thickness is a multiple of our nozzle size. Seeming as only 0.4 millimeters of plastic can be spit out at a time, it has to be a multiple. Okay. The retraction is simply to make it to where it doesn't spill plastic all over the place. One thing the parent head does like to do is drool whenever it's heated. So that helps to reduce stringing effects. All right. Bottom and top thickness is going to be 0 0.8 as well. I just prefer to have all of the walls the same width. You are welcome to change that to any value you would prefer. If you change it to zero, you will not have a bottom to your model. Okay. Fill density, that's the determinant of durability. I can show you a little bit more about that here whenever we load and slice a model. Okay. The print speed, the maximum on these printers is going to be 50 millimeters per second. And that is simply the quickest it'll go without print defects. You can increase the speed to 60 millimeters per second if you wanted to, but you may start seeing discrepancies within your object. You can decrease this value to improve quality. 
Some models will print better with overhangs at say 35 millimeters per second. Next we have printing temperature and we're gonna change this to 220 degrees Celsius. This is our preferred temperature for our PLA and that's because of a composite that makes it a little bit more flexible. Um, you may find that printing other PLA with it is also helpful at 220. All right. The support type, let's go ahead and change that to everywhere for the beginning. This is just in case students do load in a file or model that is you know, overhanging, it has arms hanging out, and they need it to be supported. This is to create that scaffolding structure underneath in order to make the object. Platform adhesion does exactly as you would think it does. It adheres to the platform. The brim is going to create a suction cup effect or create layers of plastic on the outside of the model. A raft is going to create an entire build space for the object. It'll create a layer, a couple layers thick of a model before printing the model. So we're gonna leave that one at none. We shouldn't need one for the object we're going to print. Okay. A robot that's already loaded into yours should also print without any platform adhesion. The last value we need to change is for our filament, and it, that is going to be 1.75 millimeters in diameter. That can also be seen on the side of your spool. It should have a sticker telling you what type of plastic, color, and size. All right. Perfect, so now all we have left to do is load a file in and prepare it. Okay. We wanna click here on the load option in the top left-hand corner of the blue box window. All right. And then we want to navigate into the STL files in our SD card. And we can select either the keychain or the dice. I'm going to go ahead and grab the dice and double click it to load it in. So now I have my model in my build space. Okay, I've got a robot uh, dice. Okay, so that is the next thing I was going to tell you. If you right click on one of those objects, you can delete it. Whichever one you would prefer, it's up to you. Okay. Want to print them both? By all means. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the camera controls. If you right click, it's going to rotate. If you zoom in and out, it's going on the scroll wheel, it'll zoom in and out. And then, of course, holding shift and right clicking should pan back and forth. Okay, so that, that right click also has a center on platform and you can multiply the objects in the same menu. For when you load a model in that you may want it to be printed in a different direction, then we also can left click on the model and we have three boxes that appear in the bottom left hand corner. These allow us to change our print orientation as well as scale the model. Now, when you click on rotate, it'll pull up three circles responding to each axis, allowing you to rotate it on each axis, 15 degree ticks. So you can orient the print however you would like. You can also scale it. The scale here at the top will be a percentage. The scale at the bottom is based on millimeters. Of course, you can ununiformly scale that by unclicking the lockbox and stretch your model however you would prefer. Finally, we have the mirror option. If you do mirror this dice, it will, say on the y-axis, it will change everything to be backwards. I went ahead and mirrored it, and if you'll notice, my five is currently not a five. It's a backwards five. So keep that in mind when using mirror to swap places with objects. All right. If you want to move your model around the build area, it's simply left click and drag. Now, if you want to be able to print, say, six projects at once or a small project, we could just drag them all in here and this is... Absolutely. Awesome. The exact same way we loaded the files earlier, you can actually select multiple at a time by holding control and then click open. Okay. Yep. All right. So one last thing I really want to show you is the layer view on this object. Now, the layer view is actually going to tell us what the print head is going to do in our XY plane coordinates. So if you click here in the top right hand corner on the double hourglass and then choose layers, 
at the bottom. It's going to generate a colored view. Now this colored view is telling you a couple of things. The red on the outside will be your outer wall thickness. The green will be your inner wall. Yellow is your infill density. And then the dark blue is the tool path. And this light blue just skirting around it is going to be support material. If you grab the slider here on the right hand side, it can cut down through the object and show you the interior of the model and how the fill density will support your outside walls. Now if I change the fill density to 30% instead of 20, you'll notice that the inside of the model will greatly increase in density. Now the shell thickness can also be changed in multiples of four. If you watch the green walls on this model, when I change this value, it will increase the wall structures. So those are a few things that you can manipulate just easy enough to change your durability or how you want your object to print. You could make a completely thin object with no fill density or anything if you preferred. All right. Do you have any you know, questions for this at the point in time or do you feel pretty comfortable with it? Awesome. So last thing I want to check is the very first layer. I always scroll it down to one and make sure that it is actually laying on the build area. This is just to ensure that I have enough surface area to print. Okay. So now I can save the object by clicking toolpath to SD here in the left hand corner or clicking file save G code. So I prefer file save G code because I'm picky where it goes. And I'm just going to save it into my main folder of my. Perfect. Once you feel happy and it's saved, you can go ahead and close Cura and make sure you eject your SD card. All right. All right. Perfect. So that was all of step two. Pretty easy, simple enough. All you're going to do is load your STL files into that model space in order to change your objects, manipulate them, scale them. Many times students may make objects that are much too large for the build space, and that's where scaling comes in handy in order to make it shrink it to size to an acceptable time frame. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is the third step, and that is simply to take the SD card out of the back of our USB. We're going to place that inside of our printer. So if you look at the scroll wheel on the printer and look directly beneath it, you should see a small SD card port. So let me swap cameras to show you a little bit better. There we go. I got right it. Down here at the bottom. All right. That's awesome. Perfect. So now that we've prepared the model, we've sliced it, and now it's ready to go, the only thing left for us to do in this phase of printing would be to print it. Now, since this printer has been through shipment, who knows what happens to it when FedEx X takes it, so we're going to go over a couple processes to troubleshoot it and make sure everything's up and running. Okay. The first troubleshooting step would obviously to be ensure that Cura is prepared and ready. And that's to make sure that you have your settings correct, your models oriented, and maybe you needed supports. So we covered that information. You feel comfortable with it. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the second step. Okay. The second step is just a basic mechanical inspection of our printers. We'll cover information about the extruder assembly, a couple of motors, and the limit switches that it contains. So if we want to, we can go ahead and plug it in. On our screen, and the operating system will start. You'll also hear the fan kick on as it runs all of the time, even if it's not heated.
All right, so for the second troubleshooting step, we're gonna cover a couple of the basics, and I'm just gonna point out a couple of things. So first off, this here is called the extruder assembly. It's the hot end, and it's going to consider the place where it heats up to 220 degrees is within here. There's actually a heating block that you can see from the back that is actually heats the nozzle and causes it to squirt at the plastic. So this section right here is the Bowden tube extruder. Now a Bowden tube uses a motor further away than on top of the hot end assembly in order to push the filament. So you'll notice that here we have a spring structure and a geared tooth or a tooth gear. This is going to feed the plastic through the tube into our hot end. Okay. Okay. Next, let's take a look at our limit switches and our motors. Now these, make sure these are plugged in, they can easily become unplugged. First, our X limit switch will be here on the leftmost inside. And then you can find the plug from here in the left. Yep. And then the X axis motor, of course, is directly behind it. If we continue rotating to the back, you will also see the E motor is plugged in here that we just looked at earlier. Directly down, we will have our Z axis motor, which is the spiral. And to the left of the Z axis motor, we will have our Y limit switch and our Y axis motor. All right. Okay. Now the Z limit switch is a little bit different. It sit, resides right here in front. Now this will tell it when to stop moving down. Okay. Okay, so the y-axis is the bed moving back and forth, x-axis will be this, and of course up and down will be our z. So one last thing to check is really just the belt tension. We do wanna make sure these belts spring back when you touch them. If you just wanna check those real quick, they should be pretty tight and good to go. Yep, looks good. Awesome, so the next process that we're gonna talk about is leveling the build plate. Now, almost 90% of the time, Leveling the bill plate is the troubleshooting issue. This is because printers can get out of whack pretty easily. They just shipment will cause them to go all sorts of different directions. And we're gonna go through the process of leveling. So first thing that I want us to grab is a piece of paper as we will be using one in order to level. Paper, the pink one that even came with your printer is perfect. Okay. You just go ahead and fold that in half hamburger style. And then we're going to start the leveling process. So we can put that down for a second. And we're going to need to click on the button, select setup, and click once more. And then select the value auto home. Now, auto home is going to cause us to go to this front left hand corner. So left, all the way back, and all the way down. Now, once it's at its home position, we can disable our motors. Also in setup, because it will lock them in place for safety. So we'll have to go back into setup and then click disable motors once finished moving. And the only thing we wouldn't want to move in this case is our z-axis as we're trying to level that nozzle to the plate. Okay. Move the x and y all we please. Okay, mine's still going down. Yeah. yeah, this one's still going down. <laughs> all right. Now we press the button, go to controls, you said? Setup. Setup, okay. Setup, and then disable motors. Disable motors. All right. Got it. All right. So now we have all of our motors unlocked and we can actually start using this piece of paper. So I'm going to show you three things. These are the adjustment knobs in order to level the build plate. The first one, the most difficult, is inside of here. You will see a small spring above it and then the knob below. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. Now there's also two more here on the outside. Okay. And this basically consists of a triangle that makes this back right-hand corner a little bit weird to level. So in order to 
adjust this, we would obviously manipulate this other corner, right? So pulling this one down is going to pull this one up. So that's a consideration. So what we're going to do is now that we have it at its home position, we can go ahead and line up the nozzle with that small point. So I'm going to try and get them relatively close, like so, and line up the spring and the nozzle. And then I'm going to place the piece of paper in between the two. If you can't get the paper underneath the nozzle, it is riding on springs and you can just push down on the build plate and then slide it underneath. All right. All right. All right. So what we're going to look for is a certain amount of resistance on the paper. If we can't move the paper at all, it's too close. And if we don't feel any drag from the nozzle, it's too far away. So if you can feel a little bit on the nozzle, then we would want, if it's too tight, excuse me, we would want to go clock, counterclockwise to lower it. Okay. What I mean by that is if we're looking top down on this nozzle or on the adjustment knob, it will be counterclockwise. Okay. Okay, so we're going to adjust each point in order to kind of get that sweet spot that has a drag and it almost sounds like the paper's on each point. So once you feel comfortable with that point, of course, you can move on to the next two and just let me know when you feel comfortable. All right. Just like All right, I think we're good. Okay. Yes, we'll see. We certainly will. So the only next process to talk about is the filament. And filament, of course, can cause a couple issues. You could have clogging happen. Um, you could have it drool out too much and cause problems with your build space just by globbing up. Um, so a couple of considerations to take into account. Storing spools with it through the side is a very good measure to not create knots within this area. If it does unspool, obviously it could get underneath one of these values, one of the other strands, and then cause it to knot up. At that point, of course, you're not going to get any material extrusion. It'll make your print fail and you'll have to restart it. Done that before. What are you going to do now? I'm sorry? I said I've done that before. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that I've ended up messing up on, but we'll learn from our mistakes. So 
what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and heat up the printer itself. In order to do that, we're also going to go back into setup. And then we have two preheat values. One is preheat PLA, which is the value we will select. And the second one is called preheat softball. So I'm going to go ahead and click on preheat PLA and allow it to start heating. I'm also going to move up the Z axis so it doesn't harm our build surface. So in order to do that, I simply grab the axis in the back and turn it and it should raise it up. If you prefer to not do it that manual way, you are welcome to do it on the computer screen itself in controls. So in order to do that, if you were to click on controls, choose move axis, move one millimeter and move Z. And then to get back through your screens, you simply click on the button and it'll go back at the top every value. So also the preheat soft pool was there and that heats the plastic to 100 degrees Celsius. Now use that value or that program in order to heat it up to a transition state so that it's in between a liquid and a solid. And by doing this, it allows the plastic that may already be fed into the printer to expand and grab all of the other material around of it. To pull it out at a good temperature. So if you'll notice here, I have a spool of silver filament, kind of maroon color attached to it. This is from the soft pool. There was maroon in the printer before, and by doing a soft pull, I removed that old plastic and helped to remove any old color that may have been in it. This is a good method to remove clogs. One does happen. All right. So now, the printer should be heated up. We can see that here on the screen itself. There is a nozzle indicator. The top value is what it wants to heat to. The bottom value is what it's currently at. All right, Mark. All righty. So we're going to go ahead and feed the filament in. In order to do that, first I'm going to clip this little extra that I have hanging off. I prefer to clip this at an angle to help it feed through the Bowden tube. So I'm going to clip right here behind the this part. Now here on the back trigger, you also have a pair of flesh shears in your toolkit, like so. Oh, I've got these, but they don't have a blade on them. Nope. You don't have any of these contained in it? Uh -uh. Maybe two handles? I don't think so. Nope. I didn't. I have to send you a pair. If you're having, or if you prefer to break it, you can also break it just as simply with your hands. Many times that's also what I do. All right, so once we have a nice flat end, we're going to feed it into this yellow trigger. Now, on the side of the Z-axis, you should see a small hole. We can feed it through that small hole and push it all the way through the Bowden tube. So once you have it partially, part of the way, squeeze the trigger to release the idler pulley and then push it through the tube the rest of the way. At some point, you should feel it kind of hit and cause back pressure. Once you feel that point, go ahead and push it just a little bit more in order to start extruding the plastic and push out any old colors it may have.
<laughs> so once you feel like you have your filament good and you can actually see the color you want it to be, yep. we should be ready to print. So all we need to do now is go ahead and click on the button one more time. Down to print from SD. And then select your file that you saved earlier. Now the first thing our printer will do is heat and make sure the nozzle is heated up. Then it will move to the origin point or this front left center. It'll touch down and prime the nozzle and then move to start printing. Now we're gonna watch the very first layer to make sure that the plastic lays down. And I find that this is a crucial part of the print. If you feel like it's successfully laying down, the first layer is the perfect place to adjust the knobs to where you do see the plastic stick. Mine seems a little bit far away. All right, do you see your first layer sticking down? I sure do. Well, perfect. Sounds like it went well. Another thing about these build plates, they are held on by these binder clips. You can also take these off and the build plate is flexible to pop your prints off. Okay. Awesome. Well, if you, do you have any questions about the training or any basic information about the printer? I don't think so, not yet. I'm sure we will though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you do have any questions, you're welcome to send those to myself. If you have any tech support requests or maybe an issue with the printer itself, we recommend going to our support page just at nwa3d.com slash support. You should be able to fill out a document there and explain your issues and we'll get back to you within a day. Okay, sounds good. Awesome. Uh, the PLA is safe to use in the classroom, right? Yes, PLA is safe to use in the classroom. It's gonna have kind of like a syrup smell, almost like pancakes. Um, the, old, the one that is not good to use in the classroom is ABS, as it does produce styrene fumes. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, seems like everything went smooth. So if you don't have any other questions, I'm finished with the training. All right. Okay. Sounds great. Excellent. Well, I'll go ahead and send you a follow-up email. It will also contain information about the design programs I mentioned a link to our support page, and then also a link to this video if you want to use it at any later date. Okay, sounds awesome. Awesome. Well, it's been great. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and good Christmas break. All right, you too. Thank you.